For the 1st Marine Division, this is our first battle since Guadalcanal. It is strangely quiet ashore, but we know they are there. They should have cut loose by this time. Must be waiting for point blank range. They're letting us get ashore. feet into the jungle and your feet would still be in the water. So far, not a shot has been fired. No enemy encountered. We have landed with complete immunity. With his superior knowledge of the terrain, General Matsuda had placed his limited forces with considerable shrewdness. Had the Marines known as much about the area while making their plans as a new one hour after their landing, they probably would have chosen one of the beaches where they were expected. But as man projects his training, his reasoning, his background, and his experience toward ultimate effort, the ten-star general often watches over his shoulder and with positive strokes of swift certainty covers the flaws, redraws a perfect plan. A ditch at Waterloo, the opening of the Red Sea, the bridge at Remagen. At Cape Gloucester, it was faulty intelligence. Oblique photographs taken during the pre-landing bombing strikes showed hundreds of bomb craters full of water. Since there were virtually no rim shatters, it indicated a high water table at almost ground level. Today, with hindsight, we know this. Then, we did not. And the fact that we did not know it resulted in complete tactical surprise. Some would call this misinterpretation luck. Others, fortune. Most of us recognize it as divine guidance. On the day after Christmas, the Marines landed where they were not expected. Caught General Matsuda by surprise and split his forces without the loss of a single man. This is our miracle. We hack, push, shove, crawl, anything to get through the jungle. And suddenly we find why the enemy did not expect us here. Damp flat, our map makers designated it. Damp flat, a bog. A quagmire, a swamp, a morass, sinkhole. Damp. Clear up to your chin. This is for ducks and mermaids. There is no bottom to the goo. Imagine having to move artillery and heavy equipment through 400 yards of this. A forest giant loosened by bombardment totters, crashes and we suffer our first marine casualty. We slip and slide through 900 yards of this. No wonder the enemy is not here to oppose our progress. He'd have to do his fighting from a canoe. Finally, one unit reaches firm footing, begins its advance toward the airfield. Enemy riflemen bar the way. Their general counterattack is swift, vicious. 
and lap four hours. With our bazookas, we score repeated hits, and repeatedly, the projectile malfunctions. Again, nothing. The first of our daily cloud bursts arrives. There is no shelter or escape. Shoes, socks, uniforms, equipment, all are drenched and will never be fully dry until we are taken from the island many weeks hence. Now we know why the bazooka rockets do not detonate. The earth is a chocolate sponge, sucking the projectile into the mushy softness, smothering it in impotence. We need tank support. So bulldozers scrape and fill, and a road of sorts is begun. One particular bunker is giving us a bad time. Ammunition runs low. And the only vehicle able to reach us is the Amtrak. Behind us, somewhere, the road is still being gouged. We hear a snorting, a clanking, a wheezing. Someone is going to have tank support. We ready the bazooka. But it is ours. It is welcome. It is stuck. Help comes from an unexpected source. In the open, the driver exposed to enemy fire. The driver becomes a casualty. Another Marine volunteers for his job and is hit. We give the third Marine withering covering fire. And this third bears the charm. are vindicated. They have given service above and beyond. The attack moves forward. Then began the case of the disappearing enemy. He was near. Evidence of his presence was everywhere, but somehow Colonel Sumilia managed to withdraw his troops after each engagement. The Marines could not find his real concentration of strength. On December 28, 1943, mud and rain caved in the position of Corporal Kashida Shigeto. The good corporal had been indoctrinated to expect torture and death. Instead, he was dug out given K-ration and a cigarette. He talked freely and indicated the presence of the 141st and 142nd regiments. This rocked General Rupertus, General Shepard, and their staffs back on their heels. One unit was not supposed to be on New Britain and the other many miles away. If the corporal's information was correct, the enemy was capable of throwing greater strength into the counterattack that had been anticipated. Patrols scout Razorback Ridge. Wherever he is, he has done a good job of hiding. Today, he is nowhere. Tomorrow, he is everywhere, fighting. Hours later, he withdraws and again disappears. 
Where was the main body of troops? With their limited knowledge of the terrain, the Marines sent units to block any retreat. They reported no sign of withdrawal. He was still somewhere within the area. The first clue came in the form of a message sent by Japanese Lieutenant Abe. It read, it is essential that we conceal the fact that we are maintaining positions on Aogiri Ridge. Here at last was a probable location of enemy strength. But where was Aogiri Ridge? Our own map showed two main elevations, Hill 660 and the smaller hill 150. The terrain of which his attack might come and through which ours must move was a mystery. Unusual situations demand unusual tactics and General Shepard devised one. He proposed to hold fast on the left and center of the beach perimeter, while the right of the line redeployed and attacked generally to the southeast on a front of a thousand yards. As the movement was begun, reaction was immediate. For two days, we fight an enemy we cannot see. Artillery, mortar shells, and air bombs are almost useless. They cannot penetrate the dense forest overhead. We need tanks to spearhead us across Suicide Creek. Again, the bulldozers build a road for the tanks. But the creek banks are too steep and have to be caved in by the dozers. Again, drivers become casualties. And again, the job is finished. The first takes the plunge. But again, the enemy withdrew. And again, we knew that Aogiri Ridge had not been found. As our lines moved forward, Hill 150 became the next suspect of Japanese strength. The 1st Battalion, 7th Marine, moved against it and secured it after surprisingly weak resistance. The invisible enemy and the location of Aogiri Ridge began to haunt the Marines. Most deductions placed it from 1,000 to 2,000 yards southwest of Hill 150. They are wrong. We sense we have found it, but we cannot explain the reason. The ground seems level, yet it rises as we progress. We push on. Then, for two days, we do not advance. Efforts to flank the position fail, so the dozers build another causeway for the tanks. One battalion loses two commanding officers within five hours. The third is destined for hand-to-hand -hand fighting and will leave his name to mark this stubborn, violent, invisible corner of Hades where we fight. We inch forward. One day. Two days. Three unending days. Four nightmares, five centuries, six millenniums, seven eternities. The week's progress can be measured in feet. Attempts to encircle are stopped cold. This is Aogiri Ridge. By now, the question was not whether the Marines could advance, but whether they could hold their hard-earned gain. It was then, in the words of the division's special action report, that Colonel Walt's leadership and courage turned the tide of battle. Putting his shoulder to the wheel of a 37 millimeter gun, he began pushing, shoving. Colonel Walt pulled both arms from their shoulder sockets, but he kept shoving. And his men, his magnificent Marines, added their strength. By superhuman effort, the gun was manhandled up the steep slope and into position to sweep the ridge. The Marines and the enemy were 30 feet apart. But as the Marines occupied one end of the ridge, so did the Japanese. Colonel Walt could hear them grouping for an attack. 
Four times they banzai from only yards away. We hold our fire until the crucial moment. As they regroup for the fifth attack, we are dangerously low on ammunition. A battalion command post detail gets it through with less than four minutes to spare. The fifth, furious, fast-paced, final. is ended. Aogiri Ridge is ours. At 0800 on 10 January, the Marines advanced five companies abreast towards the next high ground. They soon discovered why Aogiri Ridge had been so important to the enemy. Behind it lay a wide, firm, much used trail that did not show on our maps. It had been the chief route of supply and reinforcement for the Bogan Bay area. But it was still evident that the enemy had been able to withdraw several thousand troops. Now begins one of the war's most gigantic games of hide and seek. The enemy is retreating toward Rabaul. Somewhere in the 8,000 square mile area of western New Britain, he is fleeing. On 26 January, his main route is discovered. Ground patrols chase him to the east. Kokopo, Gorisi, Kari'ai, Iboki, Talawaga, Abmadan, Bulawatini, Ogitni. Trail juncture for the escaping units from Cape Mercus. They are ahead of us. Other units leapfrog up the coast. A few seconds after the picture of this patrol in the Natoma area was taken. October 31st, 1943. Above, friendly planes, scouting, defending, protecting. Below, friendly submarines, sounding, listening, accompanying. Around us, friendly men of war, darting, deploying, ready. And if this enemy pilot spots our convoy, he will be chased, but not destroyed, until he had radioed our location, the information that we are following a northwesterly course. At 1600, we will steer toward the Shortland Islands, and the Japanese will assume that our landing will be made on Choiselle, or the southern tip of Bougainville. He will be wrong. Under the cover of the friendly darkness, we will change our course and move swiftly through the moonless night to our real objective, Empress Augusta Bay.
later, the barrage is lifted. The order to land the landing force is given at 0645, and 7,500 Marines take their places in the LCVPs and LCMs, ready for the 1,500-yard run to the beach. The destroyers Anthony, Terry, Wadsworth, and Sigourney commence their prearranged fires. At 7.21, this fire ceases, and 31 TBFs of Marine Air Group 14, based at Munda, bomb and strafe until 7.26. of the 3rd Marines come in line with Pura Atta Island, they are taken under three-way machine gun fire from the Cape, the western tip of Pura Atta Island, and Torakina Island. Raider Battalion, less Company L, lands on Pura Atta Island and starts mopping up the anti-boat defenses. The enemy keeps them under pressure. One by one, the machine guns are silent. snipers. It is a two-day job. Meanwhile, as the boats of the 1st Battalion, 3rd Marines, continue past Pura Atta Island, they are again under machine gun and rifle fire from Cape Torokina. As they near the shore, another voice is heard. Fire is deadly. 50 high explosive shells score a batting average of 280. 14 boats are hit, four destroyed. Among them, that of the group commander. And the assault waves become disorganized. Companies of the 1st Battalion are landed in practically reverse order. These could have been the seeds of disaster. By this time, entire organizations were broken up. Platoons and companies were thrown out of position by being landed on the wrong part of the beach. Contact was lost between companies. The battalion lost its communications and therefore control of its subordinate units. In time of crisis, will I lift up a man? And a man is lifted up, then two, and then a score. Individuals thoroughly trained as small unit leaders. Individuals who know the mission. Individuals who are ready and willing to take charge in a crisis. And because every Marine has been thoroughly indoctrinated and briefed on the plan, purpose, and overall strategy of the maneuver, each is able to carry out the mission of the sector in which he finds himself. And as this unity of individuals encompasses neighbor, spontaneity of effort replaces chaos. Confusion gives way to achievement. The battle gains momentum, gathers objectivity, and proceeds without any further direction from higher echelon. The Marines had been landed in the wrong place. The situation was not well in hand. Coconut logs and sand. Banzai and a box score of 280. Other boats are on their way. 
another dozen to be sacrificed on the altar of enemy marksmanship, unless something is done, and done quickly. There is no artillery ashore. There is no time to call for naval gunfire. One unit of A Company, 3rd Marines, lands near the deadly gun. Their objective is to their left, but the 75 is on their right. There is no hesitation. Up the draw past the flanking riflemen, a sergeant, and four Marines. Then two. Forget the book. Snap the pin. Hold and take the count. Toss one. Nothing. Again. It is not enough. Pride, history, tradition, esprit de corps, and a new page is written in Marine Corps history. intent is known, our strategy fathomed, our enemy gathers his fleet. If he can sink or destroy our smaller force, the Marines will be severed from supply, reinforcement. As night falls, we are silent, thoughtful. On the back of the outgunned American Navy rides Marine victory or defeat on Bougainville. The darkness becomes taut, then oppressive, then shatters. It is 27 minutes past midnight on the morning of November 2nd. Rear Admiral Amori has begun his battle for annihilation. such a night, another man, imprisoned within his immediate confines and restrained from the conflict, distilled from anxiety the words which are now so meaningful. Then, as the dark hulls climb the horizon and slide down on our side of the ocean, our flag is still there. Admiral Murrow had been superior to the challenge. When enemy flares revealed his position, he laid down a smoke screen to distort and confuse. And the enemy gunners, who had only optical control, were able to damage only three of our ships. Our radar control fire found the enemy wherever he tried to hide. The Japanese lost two by sinking, had three damaged, and hastily withdrew. Every Marine on Bougainville was mighty proud of the Navy that night. The captain commanding B Company speaks Japanese. He moves along in an exposed position.
since any overland reinforcement must come via the Piva, East-West, or Numa Numa trails, we move quickly toward their junction. In the rainforest, you can step on the enemy before you see him. Their roadblock on the Piva trail takes three days to overcome. begins the Battle of the Coconut Grove. On the 14th, it is secured, and we own the junction of the trails. The Marines and elements of the 37th Infantry Division U.S. Army had moved seven battalions of artillery 44 machine guns, 12 81 millimeter mortars, and 9 60 millimeter mortars into place and registered them on all probable enemy positions. fired 5,760 rounds into the area. When the barrage and the assault were finished, the Imperial Japanese 23rd Regiment was no more. We had come to seize, enlarge, secure, and anchor a perimeter wherein airstrips could be built. During November, we had 90 alerts, 22 bombings, and fought four major engagements. At dawn of December 10, Marine Air Group VMF-216 lands to make its permanent base. Seven days later, four Army P-39s will do the same. By December 15, most of the fireworks are over for the Marines. Elements of the Army's 37th and Americal Division have been arriving and fighting beside us since November 9. Ten days before Christmas, 1943, command of the Torakina area passes from Major General Roy S. Geiger, 1st Marine Amphibious Corps, to Major General Oscar W. Griswold, United States Army. As rapidly as practical, Marine units are relieved. In 45 days, the Marines had achieved that portion of the victory at Bougainville. But they were leaving no better road. The biggest battles on Bougainville were fought by the United States Army in the early spring of 1944. Their valor and efficiency are recorded in the decisive manner in which they won. We were all on the same team, and teamwork won the Battle of Bougainville.